Hello, my name is Daniel Rivas Bell and I'm the module lead for Geographic Data Science, EMVS 363 or EMVS 563, depending on the program. In this video, I'm going to give you an introduction and an overview to the course so you can better get a sense of what the structure is and what the course is about. But also, I'm going to talk a little bit about what makes this course different. There's several elements in this course that are probably a bit foreign if you've been following a traditional course in the Department of Geography and Planning. And we're going to delve into those so you can know about them, but also because I think they'll make you a lot more excited about taking this course. So let's go and have a look at them one by one. In, and I'm going to start by talking about what this course is about. What is the structure? What are its main elements before moving on to assessment? So before anything, actually, I'm going to give you a self quiz. And I'm going to ask you to pause to read the questions and pause the video for 10, 15 seconds, nothing more, and think through the answers. OK, so here are the three questions for you. The first one is whether you've ever used data to make decisions in your life, whether this is um, deciding where to go, how to go somewhere or making a different purchase that you were thinking or how is data um, threaded into your everyday life? The second one is whether you've ever heard the term data science. And the third one is whether you've ever written as at least a line of computer code, whether you've programmed. OK, so I'll give you 10 seconds, pause this video, have a think about it, and then we'll pick it up again. All right, hopefully you've spent some time already thinking about this. Why did I want to start with this quiz? Because I think it gets at the essence really of what or a lot of the essence of what this course is about. So let's get a bit more uh, and let's talk about the philosophy. What do I mean by the philosophy? What is the general approach that I've taken when designing this course? You can do this course in many different ways and, and I've picked one. So let me give you exactly uh, which one that is. The first one is this idea of using lots of methods and techniques. So this course is almost, I think of it almost as a window into a lot of different techniques that you can use to make sense of data, in particular of spatial data. Now, we only have 10 weeks or we only have one semester and we could spend an entire degree probably talking about geographic data science. So that means that I have to I had to make choices into how many techniques we see and how and how much in depth we we uh, we see them. So the choice I made was taking an approach to give you a lot of methods and techniques but sort of staying at the at, not at the surface but keeping a general overview. So we're going to talk about a lot of techniques but we're going to look at a general overview. I'll focus particularly on the intuition of what the method is about. So what is a particular technique trying to do and why it's important? What kind of problems can that help you solve? Which means that there'll be also very little math. A lot of these techniques are uh, statistical methods that <clears throat> can be expressed in quite a bit of math. And if you wanted to go into more detail, you, you probably should do that. But the choice I've made here is rather than going into more detail and spending more time with just a few techniques, giving you the overview, giving you the intuition how, of how the technique works, and then not spending too much time um, on the math. However, for every technique and for every block, as we'll see in the next slide, you're always going to have further readings, things that are not necessarily core, that will not necessarily go into the assessment, but things that will allow you to explore further um, into this idea. So you might not like every single block of the course, but if some of them, they, they look interesting, then there'll be lots of opportunities for you to follow on on, on your own. And as I was saying, I'm going to place a particular emphasis on the application side. So why, why would you want to know about this technique? What's special? What can help you solve? What kind of problems can this help you solve? And what kind of challenges can help you with? And hopefully, as much as possible, I'll also try to keep everything very tightly connected to the real world. By that, I mean, what are real problems that people and society faces that these techniques that we're going to be seeing can help you solve? So what's the format of the of the course? 
It has eight blocks, which roughly are aligned with uh, weeks, but as you'll see in a second, it really, it's up to you how you want to, to structure it. So you're gonna have eight blocks. Each block will have three main um, components. There's an element that I'm calling concepts, which includes clips like this one, slides like the one you're seeing on the screen, and quite a few readings. So you're, you're going to have to read um, and do things on your own for this course. That's the first block, concepts. The second one is what I'm calling hands-on. And in this one, the idea is, is material that is mostly for you to consume, not passively, but it's for you to consume, mostly read. Um, that what it does is taking the concepts and translates them into a practical um, context. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what that what that's going to look like in, in a couple of slides, but mostly it's going to be is it, um, materials that discuss the concepts we've seen in the, context, in the context of uh, applying them on your own. And then finally, so concepts and hands-on are the elements that will give you um, knowledge, so to speak, or it'll sort of teach you things. The really important part of each blog is the final one, actually, what I'm calling DIY or do it yourself. This is a section where for every blog, you're going to have several tasks that you may want that you will have to complete. So it's almost like a challenge. Every blog is going to have your own, its own challenges. And what is going to what those challenges are going to require is demonstrate that you've understood the concepts, but also that you know how to translate them into an applied way. So all of the tasks or almost all of them will be um, applied but will require you to know the, the concepts, obviously. Okay, so this is the block, eight block, this is one block, there's eight like those. What are those about? They're broadly spl split into two main chunks. The first one contain, uh, covers blocks from A, I'm, I'm giving them letters, not to confuse them with the number of the week. So blocks A to C are all about the big picture right is about what is the context that gave rise to this course why did i decide to reshape a traditional gis course into something that's quite different and what is the societal backdrop against which this course i think is useful so that's on the concepts part that will come mostly through the concepts part through the hands-on and diy parts what we're going to be seeing in these blogs is getting up to speed with the computational tools so this is probably for some of you, thinking about the, the quiz that I just gave you, for some of you, this might be the first time you write a line of code. It might not be the first time you write a lot of code, but it might be the first time that you write a, a line of Python code. So, And the tools that we're going to use to complete the this task and to um, go over this course are going to be slightly different probably to the ones you're used to. So I'm giving the first few blocks in the applied context for you to get up to speed with all of the techniques, all of the basics uh, of the basics of the computational tools that we're going to be using. And if I had to pick one of these two for this chunk of blocks, I would say the main challenge is probably going to come on the second one on getting up to speed with comp the computational tools, particularly if you've never programmed. So if you go through the concepts part and you find them easy, don't don't get too comfortable because it, you might be more challenged on the um, hands-on and DIY. And this is the first four blocks or three. Then blocks D to block H is what I'm calling the, the meat of the course. This is where a lot of the techniques that I was talking about in a couple of slides ago are going to come in together. This is where you'll probably be more challenged on the conceptual side than on the applied because in the applied, a lot of the the building blocks, you'll have seen them on the first blocks and they'll come repeating. So the first time you see something called Jupyter Lab, which is the tool that we're going to be using, it might be challenging, it might feel foreign, but the 10th time you've opened it up on your computer and you've started working with it, you'll get very comfortable with it. And hopefully something similar will happen with um, with writing code. The first time it might be challenging, but as you're doing it over and over, hopefully you'll start 
uh, distilling some of the main patterns and things will start uh, looking a little bit more familiar. So what I want you to do and put most of your effort on on this second chunk of blogs is on the concepts of what is the techniques that we're covering, what are they trying to do and what's the intuition, how they how do they work? And this will probably require you to, to look at the clips that I've prepared for the course, but also to read on your own and to try. A lot of this is going to be problem solving with you uh, and your computer. And then the final part of the course, the rest until uh, the semester is over, is going to be focused A, on two things. One, on catching up. As I said, every blog is not necessarily designed for a single week. Some of them are a bit shorter and some of them are a bit longer. So if by the time that you would have had one blog per week, you're not fully done, that's absolutely fine. You can catch up. There's plenty of time for that. And then the other part that the rest of the course is going to be used for is preparing an awesome computational essay. And that comes to that has to do with the uh, assessment. So we'll talk about that uh, a little later on this on this video. Let's move on to logistics. This is one of the elements where this course is probably going to feel a little bit different from what you're used to. I mean, I'll, arguably, a lot of things are going to be are going to feel a little different from what you're used to this term. But in, in this context, one of the differences is that this course, the, the core materials, so of course we'll have a, a, core, uh, a Canvas site set up and I'll be using that to communicate, but all of the materials, so slides, concepts, uh, pages, uh, hands-on sessions, and DIY, all of the stuff that you're going to need to follow this course interactively is available on the website that you see on the screen. So this is something that I've been doing for five years on this course and that every year consistently picks up benef um, beneficial comments from students on the evaluation. So I think you'll really like it. Another logistic aspect that is probably slightly different to what you're used to is that we're going to coordinate a lot of the interaction on this course through something called Microsoft Teams. So you can find more information about this on Canvas and maybe you're familiar already with it. But this is going to be the central hub, if you want, for communication and collaboration with me, with the demonstrators that are going to help me on the practical aspects of this course, but also among all of the students. And, and this is something that I'm very keen on promoting and also that based on past years, students really appreciate that in the beginning, it's mostly a one directional communication from the student to me. But by the end of the course, students realize that collaboration is very, very helpful and end up using Teams much more as a tool for collaborating among themselves. And I would be super thrilled if this year was, was like that as well. So look out for more information on how to sign up and how to participate on Teams on, on Canvas. And then another aspect that makes this course probably slightly different to what you're used to is that it features quite importantly, this idea of code. Um, why? Well, there's a lot of reasons. Here's a really good video uh, that I think exemplifies why I think a course like this should be uh, taught with a lot of code. Um, in the video, you can replay it and you can go to the website and find it again. But the idea of the video is showing how a lot of the activities that historically we've done offline, what we would say in an analog mode, have little by little been being converted into um, digital activities. So while you might be used to, well, you probably weren't, but well, in the old days, we used to write things on paper. Now we write it on the computer. While we used to look up things on an actual dictionary, we now look it up on Wikipedia. While we used to take pictures with an analog camera and then develop them, now we take them on our phone and edit them on our computer. And every time we're doing anything digital, I'm going to pause this. Anytime we're going to, anytime we do something that's mediated through a computer, effectively what we're doing is relying on computer code. And the analogy that I always make here is that this is a little bit like driving a car. You probably don't need to know all of the details of the mechanics of your car. You don't need to know how to build your car, how to build an engine, how the details of the engine works. 
but you need to know how to drive, right? And that's a skill that takes some some mastering before you can actually go out in the streets without doing any damage. This analogy is basically what I think we should all be thinking about when we think about inter interacting with computers. You, you don't need to know all of the details of how the microchips that make up your computer work, but it is very useful to know a little bit about what is the, the lingua franca that a computer uses to, um, to do things. And this is computer code. So the type of programming that we're going to learn is much more akin learning to drive a car than learning to, uh, you know, the physics of a, of a car engine. So it's, it's high level, but I think it's incredibly powerful to let you do things with your computer that you, you couldn't do in other ways. How are we going to do this, uh, this learning of code? We're going to do it, whoops. We're going to do it with a programming language called Python. I'll let you a bit more time to pause the video if you want and look at the, the joke there. But what is Python? Well, it's a general programming, it's general purpose programming language. What does this mean? It means that it was originally designed as a general purpose programming language, which means that it was designed to complete pretty much any action that a computer could do. And that means that with Python, you can build a website or you can uh, build a, a desktop application or you can build um, what we will call a data science pipeline. Uh, you can write code that does things to data and that lets you learn about, about data. Why I'm using Python? Well, a lot of people who know a lot more about programming than me have pointed out Python is a really good programming language for learning to code because it's it's simple in its syntax and it's well designed to align the syntax, how the rules for writing Python works with the logic of, of programming. Programming is always about think about ideas, about how to do things in an algorithmic way, but then you have to express those ideas into a particular syntax, into a language. And Python has been recognized for being very good at matching these two, at aligning the concepts with the application. And in, in the more data um, specific landscape, it's always been recognized as really good, at, as hitting the sweet spot really between what I call proof of concept and production ready, or what other people also call uh, proof of concept and production ready. Proof of concept is really, really means that Python is a fantastic language to prototype things. When you have an idea in your mind of something you want to do, Python is a good tool to translate that idea into some working code that is not fully finished, but it kind of lets you test the waters to see if the idea um, could work or not. Production ready means that Python is also good and is actually used widely for that to write applications that are used on product in production for um, by users. So for example, uh, you might have heard of a program called Dropbox, of a service called Dropbox. A lot of the the code bit that makes Dropbox Dropbox is, is written in, in Python. So you know if it's good enough for Dropbox, it's probably good enough for almost any production ready type of operation. And much more specifically to the geospatial world, uh, Python is the industry standard. It's the language that the main GIS applications um, use. So if you've ever heard of a program called S3 ArcGIS or an open source version called QGIS, they both have uh, decided to support Python as the main language for scripting, as that is to, for extending the functionality of, of those programmings. And it's also the, uh, the main I would say it's the main language for the emerging data science um, field. So companies like Google, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, uh, all of them use Python on their day to day operations, both to analyze data, but also to build the systems that, for example, recommend you a new film on Netflix or that recommends you a new purchase on, on Amazon. It's used extensively by also by companies like the New York Times, which does a lot of data work and even uh, agencies like NASA control satellites with Python. So this is to say that if you're if you learn Python throughout this course, 
you will be able to use it for the applications that we see in this course, which is for which is a very good uh, tool. But also, it's going to hopefully widen your um, your views, and it's going to give you skills that you could then easily transfer into other very employable um, areas of of work. Okay, so that's about Python. Now let's talk a little bit about how I'm thinking you should be following the, this course and how um, how I've designed this course to be followed, right? And this is also another element where I think the course is, is quite unique uh, compared to other uh, more traditional courses. The key thing is that you should prepare and you should do your homework. And probably this is true. I know this is true for all of the courses, but even much more so for this one. This is what it's called a flipped class. You might have heard of this term or you might have not. It's a pedagogical term that's used for courses where the main emphasis on learning is shifted from the instructor, that is from me, onto the student. And this means that the course is designed and is built around yourself rather than around me communicating things to you. Of course, there, I am going to be um, here communicating things, but the center of the course and the center of the learning is designed to be you. And I always use this, um, this analogy of the gym because I think it's very, very apt. I think this course, and to some extent, I think a lot of universities, but in particular, this course is like a gym. It's like a good gym. You can pay the subscription, but that's not going to get you fit. What will get you fit is paying the subscription and going to the gym every week, often, and working hard on it. So in the context of this course, just by signing up for the course, you're not going to learn. You will learn only if you fully immerse yourself into the course, follow the materials, and, and take, take the lead. That means that you'll probably run into a lot of questions, you'll have a lot of comments, and, and that's that's fantastic. So I've also designed a lot of mechanisms and a lot of channels for this course for you to ask questions, for you to uh, provide feedback, and hopefully for you to get back answers and, and hopefully learn together. So this is, the, the fact that you're at the center of the learning doesn't mean that you're gonna be doing this on your own. Far from that, it's very much a collaborative endeavor. For that, as I was saying, the central hub for, for this course is going to be Teams. So please sign up early and use it as often as you can. Teams, Teams, Teams. You have to get on board with this. And because that will be, and also if you do, I think you will you will get a lot more benefit from, from the course and you'll learn a lot more. And I think it'll be a lot more fun. And the final one, which I probably, shouldn't say this already, but um, I think it's important to remind everyone that this is never a zero sum game. You learning more doesn't mean that your friend is going to learn less. And in fact, quite the opposite. There's a lot of evidence that shows that collaborative learning is a lot more productive. And, you know, even if it wasn't, I think it's just a lot more fun. So please do not shy away from teaming up with uh, with peers and with mates to work on the assignments to work on on the DIY sections to go to get, to go through the lecture notes together etc and there might be um, still cases where you might not get an answer right away or you might not get the exact answer that you want some and it, at those Point, you will have to figure out ways to find to find answers or to find an answers timely. So I will do my best to answer everything that all of you are trying to uh, to ask, but I might not be able to do it right away. And you might want to find yourself an answer that is quicker so you can continue with your with the tasks. Something I always try to be very, very explicit about this course is that it's much more about learning to learn rather than learning a few specific commands in Python or a few specific techniques. And, and again, this is also something that consistently over the years students pick up in the evaluations that this course was really was fun and exciting, not necessarily only or not for the specific content that it had, but because it forced you to get into a problem solving mode. There's a lot of things in this course that will require you to tinker with the computer and to think a little bit about 
I think a little bit outside the box about what you're how, what you're being asked to solve to come up with a solution. And problem solving, I think, is like a muscle going back to the gym. The more you train it, the better you get at that. And also problem solving is easily the the most transferable skill you're going to pick up at university. So if you get really good at problem solving and trying to figure out ways to solve whatever is in front of you, that's something that employers value a lot. That's something that's going to help you. And it's something that will pay off handsomely down the line uh, once you leave university. What does this mean? What does this problem solving and that is learning to learn involve? Well, learn to ask questions. And asking the question in the right way is always half the answer. So try to be uh, intentional about how you're framing a question. And this is also something, an, an, an anecdote that I've seen over the years teaching this course is that usually in the first month of the course, students will ask questions that are very simple and that usually signify they haven't thought too much about what it is they're trying to ask. For example, my computer is broken, can you fix it? And as you progress over the course, you can see how students realize how they can do things for themselves to try to solve some of the questions. And towards the end of the course, the questions are a lot more thoughtful and are usually much more about, well, this is the problem I had. This is what I tried. This is why it didn't work. Can you try to, can you help me get to the next step? But those questions are much more suitable for answering correctly, but also the evidence that you've thought a lot more. And usually in, in many cases, by the time you get to that step of the question, you don't need anyone to answer it because you've already realized for yourself what answer it is. So be really intentional about the questions you're asking and how you're asking. This is not to say don't ask questions as far as is the, the opposite. You should ask as many as you can and you should try to get every time a little better at asking questions. Also, don't expect to uh, to get an exact answer all the time. Um, a lot of the, you know, one of the things with programming is that you can solve things in many, many different ways. This is one of the, the things that make programming beautiful that really is a tool that gives you superpowers and you can use those superpowers in in different ways. So in some cases, I would have thought of a different way of solving the problem that you had. And that doesn't mean that that's the best way or that is the only way you might end up arriving into a different way of solving the question. And as long as it solves it, that's all it that matters, right? So when you ask me some questions, I'll give you some answers. Also, I don't always know every single answer and that is absolutely fine. I think recognizing that you're not always going to know the answer is is fine. So learn to ask the questions. Don't always expect an exact answer right on the spot because that, that will not necessarily happen all the time. The other step is, or the other advice is help others as much as you can because that is the best way to, in a way, to help yourself, but in, this, in the sense that it is the best way to, to learn. Um, if you're good enough at understanding something that you can teach it, that means that you have a, a level of mastering of that topic or of that concept or of that command that is way beyond the basics of just having read about it and surfacely understand it, right? So, and again, this is a muscle. The more you train it, the, the bigger and the stronger it gets. So the more you can practice helping others, I think that the better you're going to get also at understanding the concepts for yourself. And the final one, one which hopefully I, I thought I wouldn't have to tell you, but I've started putting it on these slides every year because I think it's, a, again, a really good reminder. Um, first of how you can take a self-directed uh, learning approach, but also how, how to learn to problem solve. If you have a question these days outside university, what would you try to do to find the answer? Maybe you would Google it. So why would you not apply that into this context? A lot of the answers, a lot of the questions that you'll have about programming in this course have, have you know, other people have had them before and other kind people have had them in the past and they've been nice enough to go on the internet and write an answer. So if you can find it much more timely there, um, that why would you not use it? Also, 
this goes back to what I was saying about learning to learn. I don't want to always give you the answer right away. Sometimes you will ask me something and I'll say, well, look it up first. See if you can find the answer for yourself for two reasons. But well, the first one, because I think that this, this will help you um, get into a mode, get into a mood where when you have a question, the first reaction you have is trying to solve it for yourself. But also, and the second reason, because again, as I was saying, learning to ask questions is a muscle. The more you do it, the better you get at it. Asking questions to Google is not that different from asking questions to a demonstrator. So the more you can try it and the more you can practice it, the better you will get. And again, this is if, if this seems as an incentive, this is something that every year I see it very, very clearly with students. The type of searches and the type of uh, problem solving the students do on the first month is very different from the ones they do two weeks before Christmas. By then, everyone is really attuned to trying to translate your problem into Google parlance or Stack Overflow parlance, which is something that you'll, um, you'll soon be introduced to when you start searching for, for programming questions on the internet. And this is a skill. So again, the more you do it, the better you get at it. So what is the workflow that I'm planning for this course and how I'm expecting you to follow the course? Again, another unique feature of, of how I've designed this, this curriculum. There's going to be two big sides of it. One is before the lab and the other one is during the lab. The main the main point of contact this semester with me and with the demonstrator is going to be through the synchronous labs, so through the live labs that we're going to do um, together. That means that to make the most of them, you will have to do work on your own beforehand. So here is how I'm recommended that you that you do it. Before a lab, what I'm hoping you will do is go over the concepts and hands-on sections. These are parts of the course, parts of the material content that I've designed to be able to be followed entirely on your own. So you don't need, you shouldn't need anyone to get a, to get started with them. They contain clips, they contain slides, they contain text that you can read. They refer you to other parts and other references to read through and you sh should be able to do it on your own. So the first thing you need to do before we uh, meet for the lab is go over the um, those two sections for each for the block that you're working on that week. Then also, ideally, you will have get started on the DIY section. So the, the sections where you have some where you have to complete tasks and the combination of one and two will probably hopefully I would expect that it will create and it will prompt you to have some questions and comments. And this means that probably the first time you read over the concepts section, the first time you watch a clip for a blog or the first time you read uh, a book chapter that I will have recommended for you, not everything will be clear. You will not understand everything. That's absolutely fine. This is another feeling that I think for this course, but more in general, you should learn to get comfortable to to learn something and not understand everything and not get a full control the first time. Learning is always like an onion. It has a lot of layers. The first time you learn something and you don't learn a lot of other things. The second time you already know something and you learn something else. And the more you go over a concept from different angles, the first time might be a, a clip that you watch uh, with me and some slides. The second time that you get into a concept might be reading uh, a chapter of a book that I've recommended for the blog. And that might be a bit more advanced, but you already know something from the clip. So once you, you go over those materials, you'll hopefully have questions. What I want you to do before the lab is record those questions. So keep track of those, particularly of the core ones. So as you're reading, Maybe don't write every every single thing that you don't understand. But once you finish reading something, please pause, take a second to think what are the the main things that I feel 
if I know, will get me to the next step of, of understanding on, of this concept. Record those, write those down, and please, this is important, post them on Teams before the lab. So there is a record for that. I can keep track of what are the areas that most students or that students are not finding super in, um, intuitive. And A, I can keep track of that for improving the course, which is also something I'm very keen on. But also because once we move on to the second part of a, of a blog, which is once we are on the online labs, I will be able to every week run over the main uh, questions that we have um, that we have collected on teams over that week for that blog and provide answers for everyone so the labs will have two main um, two main purposes the first one is and this is the main one actually i should say is please come to the labs show up i mean show up you know digitally uh, to work on the DIY sections. This is the best way I've found to try to uh, complete the task that I've, I've set for you on, on this course. Come and work on the labs because, for various reasons. A, because it's a, it's a recurring um, event on your calendar. Every week there's two, we two hours that are scheduled for the labs of this, uh, of this course which means that it's an easy excuse for you to then spend two hours working on the on the course. Second, because any problems that you're running into, you will be able to get direct support from me and from other demonstrators that will be um, there helping people out. Third, because you will find that those things that you've started trying to solve and seem impossible, well, you weren't the only one. Other people had those problems too. And also, it's a lot more fun if you try to solve them uh, together. So I'm thinking and I'm preparing a lot of really exciting ways in which we're going to enact this collaboration online. And I'm really excited to see what you what you think about that. So please drop by to the uh, lab sessions every week to to work on your on your progress on, on the course. OK. So that is everything I wanted to tell you about the course and about what the course is about and why, it, why it's unique. Now, the second part of this clip, I'm going to talk a little bit on this final part of this clip. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, assignments. This is not something that I'm super keen on and that I, I don't think is the most fun part of this course, but it's nevertheless, it's, it's useful. We need to know how much you've, you've learned when we, when we get to Christmas. So... This is what the assignment diet of this course looks like. There is three main um, components. One is two computer tests, one on week five, one on week 10. The first one takes 20% of the final mark and the second one a little bit more, 25%. And I'll provide more details about the tests as we're approaching that uh, those dates. The second one, which is the main component is what I'm calling computational essay. It happens at the very end of the course and it takes half the final mark. So it's a really important uh, part of the assessment. It's equivalent to an essay of 2,500 words, although although as we'll see, um, it's this is equivalent. It doesn't mean that you have to write 2,500 words. And it's a it's written a report report style using a technology called the Jupyter Notebook, which we'll use extensively in this course. And you'll have to include code figures, so maps that you make up with you make with your code, and text. So there's a narrative element, and there'll be a lot more information as we approach to the um, to the end of the course and how to complete this essay. What is what does a good essay, a good computational essay look like? What are the tricks that you can keep in mind to, to make sure you get a good mark? So don't worry, there'll be a lot more support for that as we're moving on. And then the final one, even though it's actually the, the, main, the first one that you should start thinking about, is a 5% of the mark that goes into the discussion board. And this is 5% or 5 points that you will get simply for signing up on Teams and contributing into the discussion of Teams, that is asking a question or answering somebody else's uh, question or more generally participating, 
within the first month of the course. This is the important thing. And I'm doing this this way because I've realized that um, by the time we're halfway through the course, everyone's realized that Teams is really useful and everyone gets on anyway. What I want to make sure is that everyone realizes how useful it is and gets up to speed with Teams as soon as possible. So for that, I'm making sure that uh, that you get five points if you engage with Teams within the first month of the course. And then a final note, just you probably are not thinking about that just yet, but I want to lay out all of the rules of the game um, from the very beginning. At some point, you will finish this course and a lot of you will, well, everyone will probably go on to do amazing things in in life. Some of those might involve me writing a reference letter, for example, for a master's program. And I'm really happy to write letters, but I'm always very honest in my letters. So for that, I've decided over the years, again, that I'm only writing letters for people who get a 70 or more. So for people with a first. Okay. So... This was the overview for the course. Hopefully it clarifies a bit more uh, what this course is about, how it's going to be run, and hopefully it also gets you really excited, excited and fired up about taking it and uh, started learning geographic data science.